Good afternoon. It's time to continue our Bible discussion through the story of the church in the book of Acts. And so let's jump in. We're going to take some time to review the, the principles we talked about in how to read the Bible. And then we're going to look at some of the themes of moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament as we look now at the book of Acts. So we'll summarize the book of Acts, specifically though looking at the first 12 uh, chapters, which really completes a few of the initial sections of the book. Look at some of the harder biblical questions that we'll come across, and then some of the conclusions that we're going to make about God. Uh, theology just is the study of God, and so those uh, questions that we conclude with, we'll just talk about primarily the role of the Holy Spirit. So to review how to read the Bible, it's to, to know God. And so we read to know him as revealed through the scriptures. And then it's important to respond to him in this spiritual relationship that we share through prayer, through uh, some sense of obedience to the word that we're reading. So a sense of action and then to worship God and to uh, really acknowledge what he's doing through the lens of what we read in the scriptures. And then to get more in depth in knowing who God is, these are good steps of interpretation. Specifically, the first three really get at that first step of how to read the Bible uh, to know God. And so we first see, we look at what we observe, and then the understanding is that step of understanding what does it mean to them, the original audience. And so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is what how the original audience would receive uh, what this story is that we're looking at in Acts uh, 1 through 12. And then to share what's what's that timeless truth, that principle that will stay with us. And so that's really looking at how to read the Bible, to know God, and then the response again, what does this have to do with my life? So we we pray through scripture, we respond in obedience to scripture, and then we, we worship God uh, who reveals uh, himself through the scriptures. And so let's begin with some review of the biblical story. So in the biblical story, God becoming man as Jesus to fulfill God's promises to humanity is the turning point in the Bible. It's moving the story in a new, different, and unexpected direction. And so after all these incredible stories that we read to this point, seeing God work through his people, such as Abraham and Joseph and Ruth and David and Haggai and many others, the reader is still left with a lot of unanswered questions, which we identified through our reading to this point. Now, as we come to the New Testament, though, the exciting part is the unanswered questions of the Old Testament are answered in the person and work of Jesus, and it's revealed through his Gospels and New Testament letters. So let's look at that through <clears throat> these important um, uh, topics of the Old Testament that are answered in the new in Jesus. So Jesus is the wounded victor. That was one of the questions that was raised is who is the wounded victor? And so he conquered evil and death by resurrecting to new life and thus initiating the new covenant by his sacrifice on the cross. The second thing is that Jesus is the messianic king from the line of David who will bless the world as promised to Abraham by inviting all people to live under his reign and follow him. And then third, Jesus is the greater Moses, forming a new people of transformed hearts who base their lives upon his upside down teachings to lead by serving, to love one's enemy, and to welcome the poor. And the poor being the broken and the social outcasts, that they are also invited into the family of God. So we saw a lot of these themes of uh, Jesus is the greater Moses, Jesus is the fulfillment in the line of David. These came through our reading in the book of Acts. And so as we're reading through the New Testament, just remember the revela revelation of Jesus is the climax in the story of the Bible, who forever changed the landscape of human history. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the wounded victor. He's the prophet greater than Moses, and he's a messianic king from the line of David. He's the answer to our unanswered questions of the Old Testament. He is the turning point in the Bible and our lives. So a couple of new or a few New Testament themes. As we're reading through the, the New Testament, 
we're going to repeatedly encounter four key themes which are influenced by this significant transition from the old to the new era that is initiated through the arrival of Jesus. And so the first theme is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the rule of God that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. He initiated the kingdom by his first coming and his reign that will ultimately be consummated in his second coming in the future. So believers today are therefore citizens and children of the kingdom, which the apostles preached about. We read about that in Acts, and which we will read about continually through the New Testament. The next theme is the new covenant, that under the new covenant, God's instruction will be kept because God will give his people a new heart. And so similar to the kingdom, this is initiated at the first coming of Jesus by his blood on the cross, but the full realization awaits the second coming of Jesus. <clears throat> okay, everything going okay, Drake? Can you see it okay? Oh yeah, I see everything. <clears throat> now third, the next theme is about the Spirit of God, which is a major theme in the book of Acts. And so here we are going to see that every believer receives the Spirit of God as part of the new covenant, which began at Pentecost in Acts 2. And the Spirit empowers all believers to know and live more like Jesus. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Now, the, the last theme is the gospel message. It's proclaimed by every New Testament author. We saw it again and again in the book of Acts. Uh, this message is the good news of Jesus accomplished by his death, resurrection, and ascension. These events proclaim Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice for sins, his victory over death for all of mankind, and his victory uh, enthronement over the principalities and powers as he takes his place of authority at the right hand of the Father. So all said, as we begin reading the New Testament, which we're still at the beginning stages of it, understand how significant it is to interpret the biblical story through the person and work of Jesus. He brings the Old and the New Testaments into one unified story about him who continues into our life through a personal relationship with him. So let's jump into the introduction of the book of Acts, the purpose, some of the plot line, and the characters. And so in this second volume of one unified work called Luke Acts, Luke continues the story of Jesus through his spirit and his church. These are the two themes that are intricately woven throughout the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit empowers the church to live transformed lives on mission for Jesus. Now, this is so important to see that, that Luke even recorded the many signs and wonders that were testimony of the Holy Spirit's presence in this new spiritual organism called the church. It was critical to validate the unique ministry of the 12 apostles who were the foundation. They were part of the establishment of the early church. And so this mattered greatly as Christianity grew beyond the Jewish borders to become a global movement. And so this account, this revealed the spiritual source of all that these new Christians from new worlds were introduced to and lived out as they themselves continued the story of Jesus by relying on the power of his spirit and by trusting in Jesus' name. And so Luke produced this volume to build upon his gospel. Uh, this isn't an independent work. This continues what he started through the gospel of Luke. And it was just the beginning point for him to show all of what Jesus continues to do and teach through his spirit and his church, not only in the book of Acts, but as today's church follows in their footsteps. So really the story of Jesus is just getting started. Now, in terms of the character development, <clears throat> as we read the book of Acts, we're learning more about Jesus, who continues the story as the primary character by leading his disciples through his spirit to go out into the world and invite all the nations to live under his reign and continue his movement. You, you see that even in what we read uh, when, for example, Paul, uh, when he is confronted by Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'm the one that you're persecuting. So it really is a concrete uh, example of, of how Jesus is the primary character of Acts. The disciples are, are really being led by him and empowered by him to continue the work that he's doing in their lives. And you see this in his promise of Acts 1.8. This frames the book of Acts kind of like a thesis statement. And it says that his spirit, 
will immerse his disciples with his presence by taking up residence in them so that they become a people where the world encounters God. And so this means that even the stories about his faithful followers, including the original disciples that we already met in the Gospel of Luke, but then also his new followers as well, such as uh, Paul and Barnabas and Apollos, all of their stories are really about Jesus who is working in and through them as they trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit to lead them, as they share the good news of their risen Lord, and as they form diverse communities united in their allegiance to him and his teachings. Uh, Jesus chose his followers to build his church with him so that his church brings his presence into the world. By themselves, these men and women can only offer themselves, but with Jesus indwelt in them, they powerfully share his life and story with the world in the book of Acts. So this is really a story of, of Jesus. Now, as we look at kind of the drama that unfolds, uh, the promise in one Acts 1.8 frames the storyline as Jesus Jesus works through his church to launch a global movement that begins in Jerusalem, continues into the nearby Judea and Samaria, and goes beyond what is foreseeable into the ends of the earth. And so the storyline of Acts is shaped by the growth of the church as the gospel moves out into the world, the good news of Jesus. And so with the uh, original group numbering about 120 believers, as we look at the start of the church with the with the Spirit coming down in chapter 2, the church uh, began, and it was birthed in Jerusalem. And we saw that right after that, they added about 3,000 to their number, which is an incredible uh, response. And then moving ahead to chapter 6, the church has grown as the disciples multiplied greatly. They didn't add at that point. They multiplied that. They were each taking responsibility for the mission that Jesus had given them to share with those that they encounter, and it started to multiply. And that leads up to chapter 8, when the persecution scatters their witness into Judea and Samaria, thus moving the church out into new ethnic groups. By chapter 11, there's now a new church in Antioch, Syria, the Gentile uh, area outside of, of Israel, which became the new base camp for the church to continue growing into the ends of the earth through Paul's missionary journeys that we're going to look at next time, starting in Acts 13. But looking all the way to the end, finally, in chapter 28, Paul arrives in Rome, which is the center of the known world. And that implies the work continues with the reader, who will, who will follow in their footsteps and bring a gospel witness beyond the, the known world into the ends of the, end, ends of the earth, and thus grow the church into new places and new people groups. And so in short, the book of Acts is the story of Jesus working through his church to launch a global movement that changes our world. And we're a part of it. There's even an organization uh, that's called uh, Acts 29 that speaks to that uh, truth that we continue the work that Jesus is doing in our lives. Now, as we look at the structure, <clears throat> it's within this geographic and missional framework highlighted in Acts 1.8 that the book of Acts is divided into five parts. So you see the first part in Acts 1, that's uh, Jesus' commission. And then he ascends. And so in Acts 2 to 7, the focus is on the arrival of the Spirit and the birth of the church in Jerusalem. Not just a new church plant, but the church began uh, in Acts 2. And it continued in that section. We'll, we'll look at that more together. Then in Acts uh, chapter 8 through 12, Luke describes their life within the Jesus movement as it extends into uh, Judea and Samaria. And then in chapters 13 to 20, Luke recounts the mission of the church that extends into the ends of the earth. So it's going according to Acts 1.8 said. And then finally, the chapters 21 to 28, Luke shares about Paul's witness that spreads to Rome, the center of the known word, world, whereby the work will continue as the reader follows in their footsteps. So I want to pause there and just hear from you. And I just love just to understand just what stands out to you, Drake. And I hear that, or I see that Erica's on here too. Great to see you, Erica. But how does that help you in understanding uh, the birth of the church and just how much uh, Jesus is the primary character? 
Um, for me, I think that it's kind of cool how we're still working on the going to the ends of the earth, making churches to spread the word. Um, one of my questions was, when God comes down from heaven, will we stop that movement or will we keep on doing that? Because I feel like doesn't all the other people go to other places? Yeah, so that's a really good question, Drake. So we're in that uh, transition time when we're waiting for Jesus's second coming. So his first coming was uh, the story of the Gospels. And we read about that in Luke's perspective. And so when he ascended in Acts 1, you're right that that he'll come back uh, in the future at a time that we we don't know, but he is coming. And so between now and then, we do have this responsibility to let people know about the gospel so that people have an opportunity to respond. Okay. And then my other question was, um, when you're talking about Luke Acts, is that Luke through Acts or did Luke write Acts? Right. That's a, yeah. So that's a really good question, bud. So the way that the Bible that we have, it separates uh, Luke, the gospel of Luke from the book of Acts, but they're actually one two-part volume. So it's kind of like Lord of the Rings. There's multiple volumes to okay. that story. And so Luke is volume one, which is, or Luke, the gospel of Luke is volume one, which is about Jesus uh, on earth, his person and work. And then Acts is volume two, which is about Jesus uh, working through his spirit and the church. Okay, that makes sense. And that's what's so I... significant, though, bud, because it really speaks to how Jesus is, is in us doing the work. We don't we don't pick up where he left off. Like, he continues his work through us. Okay. And then my last question was, how would we learn about God if church wasn't a thing? Like if they didn't create church, how would we know about it, him? Man, that's a great question. I think as we've read through the Old Testament, that it really highlights how committed God is to making himself known. And so I only know what is reality, which is this is the way that God's designed uh, his world to encounter him through creation, through Jesus, and then Jesus working through us. And so we have a responsibility and an opportunity to continue uh, allowing Jesus to do his work that he designed this way. And so I, I think it's a it's a good question you're asking. I, I'd say that we just want to take responsibility for what he's giving us. Uh, and it really comes out of the relationship that we have, but it's not something we force. It's something that's a response to, to what he's doing. Okay. Thank you. That was interesting. Yeah. Good questions. Erica, do you have any thoughts just as we introduce Acts? We'll jump here, jump into Acts 1 through 12, but just wanted to hear from you. Um, not really. Actually, I always like the way, I mean, you kind of uh, walk through this instead yeah. of uh, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, kind of have a big picture. So, yeah. Good. So I'm, well, I'm ready to roll. <laughs> yeah, let's do Let's roll then. I just, I don't want to I just want to make sure I think the biggest point then I'll just say before we move into the specific chapters is verse uh, Acts 1 1 when it says uh, in the first book which is referencing the gospel of Luke I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach and so that's that's where we don't want to rush through that and just remember as we're talking about the church in Acts and then as we follow in those footsteps Jesus is doing the work and so I just think that was kind of new for me when I realized that, that this isn't a story mm -hmm. of the disciples. This is a story of Jesus working through his disciples. Yeah, that's a good point. I, that was so, well, this is so, so the first time I'm uh, taking this lens. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. All right, well, let's, let's continue. We'll look at Acts 1 through 12. So as you look at the, the structure, we're going to highlight the commission the arrival of the spirit and birth of the church which is probably one of my favorite things I've learned is what's going on in chapters two to seven. And then we're going to look at the Judea Samaria section in chapters eight to 12, which is really framed by the lives of, of Philip and Paul and Peter. And then next time we'll get into the mission of the church. Today is really going to focus on these kind of initial chapters. So, Book of Acts, part one, start of his church. So uh, in chapter one, 
This begins with the risen Jesus instructing his disciples for 40 days about the kingdom. Again, that's a major theme in the New Testament, his inauguration of the kingdom, his, his coming to uh, inaugurate that. Now, that connects the story back into Luke's gospel. And uh, Jesus promised the spirit of God's presence would soon come to reside in them as his new temple to transform their hearts and to empower them to be his witnesses, inviting all the nations under his reign. Now, the significance for the Jews is how the Spirit not only immerses them with the reality of God's presence, but this also fulfills one of their messianic expectations, the promises that they had from the Old Testament, whereby God's Spirit would take up residence among his people, which brings the story even further back into Isaiah and Ezekiel and Joel. You can see the scriptures referenced on, this, on the screen. Now, <clears throat> the, the coming Spirit as foretold by the prophets, demonstrates God's continued commitment to partner with his people. So it just brings us back into the foundation of the story that we went through this year, the, the Old Testament, that, that Jesus is, is really fulfilling what expectations were created from those promises in Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Joel. And so from the commissioning, though, uh, Jesus is taken up in a cloud. Now is again foretold in Daniel 7. And it's to show that he's sharing in God's rule over the world, which he will bring fully here on earth when he one day returns, which is what you're talking about, uh, Drake, that that reign that, that he inaugurated, that it'll be completely uh, consummated in his second coming. Now let's look at chapters 2 to 8, which is the Jerusalem section. Uh, Jesus' followers wait in the city until the Feast of Pentecost, when Jews from all over the ancient world arrive there to celebrate, they're there to party. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples as a great wind and as flames over each person's head. Now this is significant because for the Jews, this would remind them of stories from the Old Testament when God's glorious fiery presence filled the temple. And so this means that God's glory filled the church, but not by dwelling in the temple building, but by dwelling in his people who are unified by their allegiance to Jesus, who, who announces God's reign to the nations. And so the prophets had promised when God came to dwell in his new temple, he would reunify the tribes of Israel under the messianic king, which has been fulfilled and demonstrated as the Israelites now acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah. And then literally thousands respond, forming faith communities filled with generosity, humility, and joy. Now, at the same time, there's this growing opposition that we also see that the coming of the Spirit and what happened to the start of the church started to create hostility with Israel's leaders because the new temple of this Jesus community was fulfilling and threatening their purpose. And so Luke is going to dig into this conflict, and he's going to do it by presenting contrasting events between the old and the new temples through his symmetrical design in chapters 3 to 5. You can see that on the screen. You can see the beginning in Acts 2.46. You'll see a mention of the disciples gathering daily in the temple courts and house to house. Well, you see it again to frame the bookend in uh, Acts 5.42. And then kind of the next contrasting events is Peter healing and preaching in the temple, and then he's arrested and tried. You see that in Acts 3 to 4, part A, and then Acts 5b. And then at the culmination, Jesus, uh, his followers sell their possessions to support the poor, which you see that both in a positive way and a negative example. Uh, in the positive, it's, I believe, Barnabas, is the one that sells and it's it's themed and that's just mentioned briefly but people focus more on the negative example through Ananias and Sapphira Sapphira that, that that they're judged and we'll talk about that in a second. And so this symmetrical design just helps us kind of understand in this section this Jerusalem section what is the original author wanting us to understand. So in this section it begins with God's new temple the community of Jesus followers who are gathering every day in the temple courts and house to house. And then it builds towards two stories of Peter and the other apostles healing people in the temple court. So you see the theme is, is predominantly in the temple. And then only in response to that uh, is that the temple leaders arrest them. 
And then this culminates with the seemingly maybe random but central issue, which is how the church donated funds to help the poor, which Israel's leaders were supposed to do. And so that's kind of the issue is this, this generosity is commendable, but a Jewish reader would understand how this practice was supposed to be happening through the Jerusalem temple and its leaders, and it wasn't. And so that's where the new the new temple, the church, is, is really fulfilling what, what the temple is supposed to be doing. And so Luke's point is clear. The new temple of Jesus' community is fulfilling the purpose God always intended for the Jerusalem temple. It's supposed to act as a place where the world encounters God's generosity and healing presence, which was lived out through those stories with Peter. Uh, the conflict reaches a climax with Stephen, who is murdered, and then that launches persecution that drives the church from the city and into Judea and Samaria, and that's the next section. And so God used this tragedy to fulfill his purpose for the church to move out and reach all the nations kind of into that next stage that was framed by the promise, the thesis statement of Acts 1.8. And so let's look at now the Judea and the Samaria section in uh, Acts chapters 8 through 12. And so this diverse group of stories retold how a Jewish community of Jesus followers became a multi-ethnic and international movement. And so the first story is, is centered around Philip, a uh, good name. <laughs> he entered Samaria, which was Israel's hated enemy, and yet many came to follow Jesus as he shared the gospel. And then we start to hear about Saul, who later became Paul, who persecuted the Christians. He met the risen Jesus and became a passionate advocate for Jesus. And again, you see just in that story the how Jesus is a central figure because uh, Saul wasn't persecuting the Christians, he was persecuting Jesus. And then finally, we see this significant story uh, from Peter, who saw the Spirit powerfully come upon the Gentiles, just as it happened for the Jewish disciples in Jerusalem. Now, it's from these stories that it's kind of building uh, upon the tension that was created by the, the tale of the two temples in chapters 2 to 8, and now they're 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 responding and moving out, sharing the gospel, furthering the movement. <clears throat> and then we see here in uh, chapter 12, the introduction of what's going to be kind of the new base camp. And so all of this led to the founding of the first large multi-ethnic church in Antioch, which was the largest, most cosmopolitan city in that part of the Roman Empire. And, and Luke tells us that Barnabas, his name means encourager, he came alongside Paul. Uh, he's a Jewish leader from the Jerusalem church, and uh, he went to Antioch with Paul to help establish this new multi-ethnic church plant, where Jesus' followers were first called Christians here. Christian just means little Christ, so they're identified with Jesus. And it's also where the first international missionaries would be sent out in the subsequent chapters. That's going to be uh, chapters uh, 13 and after. And it's, it's them continuing the global movement to fulfill Jesus' commission to go and make disciples of all the nations, all the people groups. And so as we look at these first uh, 12 chapters, the book of Acts is more than a historical count of the early church. It, it's a story that reveals how Jesus continues his story through the coming of his spirit to empower the church who bears witness in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, and will continue to do so through future faithful followers of Jesus who bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, which is the focus of the next chapters ahead. So I'm going to pause there and just open it up to Drake and, and Erica. If there's any thoughts that you have of those first few chapters in Acts, just what stories stood out to you and, and what questions do you have? Um, mine was probably when God was like, Jesus was leaving, was going like to heaven on a cloud. Was the cloud like supposed to represent like he was making heaven or was it just like a kind of cloud car that he was just bringing up to go up back there? Yeah, there's a couple perspectives on that. One from a Jewish perspective, it's a, a fulfillment of Daniel 7. And so it's representing that Jesus is... is at the right hand of the father. And so he's, he's ascended to reign. 
And so okay. he's an authority. Uh, from a, a kind of a Gentile Roman perspective, there's stories of of Caesar, I believe, that would ascend into the clouds. And so it kind of spoke in a similar message that Jesus reigns, that he's an authority. And so okay. th those are good thoughts to, to work out because it's not a normal way of communicating authority in a 21st century you know yeah. people don't just ascend to clouds but it, it it was significant in fulfilling the old testament and also in speaking into kind of their view of of authority with uh this the uh caesar who was okay. really their, their understanding of that hmm. and then on the part where there was fire on the church's heads was it like um just the church like did he choose them because he, they were following him yeah so they they are described as believers uh just earlier in in chapter one there's about 120 believers yeah. and so those that trusted in jesus the spirit came upon them and it was uh depicted and, and experienced as you know fire and wind which for a jew would they would have thought of the old testament stories of God being represented by fire and wind. And so it was a significant surprise that God didn't go into the temple building, but came upon the people. And so that matters a lot for us, Drake, because that tells us that God's not, and there's later stories that I think Stephen or Peter was talking about that God's not defined by this world. Um, and so he's not defined by a building. Uh, he yeah. He's indwelling his people, the church, to, so that the world encounters him through them, through their love of God and, and, and one another and their neighbor. Okay. And then building onto that, because they had on the 120 people, they had the fire on their head. They went to from 120 to 3,200, you said. Does that mean that, that after that, yeah. did they have fire on their head too? So, so that what we know is what happened uh, at the day of Pentecost, but that was really to communicate that something significant just happened. And so okay. after that, we actually see, because it's still a question, like up until that point, the spirit came upon the Jews. And so as the spirit was indwelling non-Jews, there would be signs and wonders to communicate that God's presence was indwelling them just as he had indwelled the church. Okay. So, so no, no more fire that, that I read past chapter two, it was really to, to, to demonstrate that God's presence was upon his church, just like God's presence was indwelt in the old Testament temple. Oh, okay. Yep. And then my last question was, why was Stefan murdered? Yeah, so he he proclaimed that Jesus uh, is God, and and he he retold the Old Testament in a beautiful way, and um, and then it culminated by him saying that you you are the ones, the leaders, the old, the Jewish uh, leadership establishment are the ones that crucified Jesus, who's God. And so that was, you know, blasphemy. So they dragged him out and stoned him. But oh, even in, in the end of his story, he he looked up and saw Jesus uh, standing in authority. So even in that really horrible moment for the church, Jesus still reigns, which is really important because during persecution, it can feel like the world's winning. But in that story, it's it's to say that even when the world can seemingly have the advantage by killing Jesus is still on the throne. It's just he hasn't come back yet to consummate his reign yet. Okay. That was my last question. Yeah, good questions. I Stevens uh he gave a message uh to the leadership of the Jews and he did a, a wonderful job just bringing out those Old Testament themes of of how Moses said there would be someone coming that's greater than him who's Jesus that uh, Abraham was a man of faith. Uh, stepped out and were to be people of faith and then talked about David and uh, the messianic king that who's coming. And so, you know, he's basically sharing how the old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus in a really condensed way.
Any other thoughts, Erica, just about Acts 1 through 12? I love just the the contrast in 2 to 5 uh, about the, the church and the temple. But uh, there's a lot there. Yeah, I think like you say, there's a lot there. So yeah. <laughs> thanks, Drake, to ask uh, uh, six questions so far. I think that's every <laughs> question. This seems either I I haven't thought about this or 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 you already asked. So mm, thank you. Sure. Yeah, you're welcome. And and I want to bring up a couple of questions that that I anticipated that come out of a couple of the challenging stories. So again, when we're reading through the book of Acts, it's really to understand the start of the church and the Holy Spirit and, and what our expectations are today. And so as we're reading through the book of Acts, there's a lot of dr dramatic moments that happen because it was the, the inauguration of the church. The church just started, not just a church plant, but the church overall. And, and so some of the confusion can be like, well, what are, what expectations can we have in today's church for what we read about in Acts? And so I want to look at two kind of challenging biblical questions. First, talking about uh, the work of the Spirit, and then the second, talking about uh, demonization that we, we see here. And so... <clears throat> Uh, if, if we looked at some of the examples of the Holy Spirit coming upon, especially the Gentiles, but there's a at times a delay where uh, it kind of communicates, okay, is there a delay in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? And so I want to look at that. We saw it in Acts 2, Acts 8, and then Acts 19. It was 2 verses 38 to 40. And so in, in Acts 2, 38 to 40, and then Acts 8, 14 to 18, in Acts 19, 1 to 7, it seems like there's a delay in the giving of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts 2, when we look at that, Peter's not giving a condition of baptism in order to receive the Holy Spirit, but he's affirming that baptism is a natural response to this inward uh, conversion. So I want to look at that briefly. It's uh, Acts 2, 38 to 40. And he's in Peter saying, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. And then uh, <clears throat> many um, responded, received, and were baptized, and then uh, 3,000 were added. And so it just seems like uh, it says you will get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so they were baptized. So it just, again, to, to say that this is consistent with, with our understanding of baptism, <clears throat> well, Drake, can you still hear me? It says that my internet's unstable. Can you hear me now? Uh, I can. Yeah, I can now. Okay. Where did I break up? Um, Just when you're trying to find the verse. Oh, okay. So, so then you didn't miss anything. I was just kind of highlighting what was said. It just, those verses communicate that Peter's saying get baptized and then the spirit's coming. So, uh, but it's not saying that's a condition. That's what's important to see. And so this is consistent with our understanding of baptism. It's a symbolic memorial to commemorate a spiritual reality, which is a transformation that we experience by receiving the Holy Spirit. So you don't get baptized as a condition for the Holy Spirit. That's just a way to, to uh, commemorate what happened. Now in Acts 8, the delay here was important to achieve unity in the church. It was a sign for the Jewish Christians to recognize that the Samaritan converts were saved like what happened to the Jewish Christians in Acts 2. So again, Drake, as it talked about the significance of what happened in Acts 2, very dramatic retelling with the wind and the fire. Now in Acts 8, there's a delay in the Samaritan converts receiving the Holy Spirit, not because that's what's going to be typical, but that was to be uh, a sign for the Jewish Christians to know that this is real. And so <clears throat> this is significant to the story of Acts, which explains how God's work extended beyond the Jews to transform the Gentiles, which was unexpected and required greater emphasis that their experience of transformation was real and was true, just as demonstrated by the Holy Spirit, uh, who's indwelling in the Jews that we saw in Acts 2. Now, Acts 9, uh, 19 
some Jews were baptized into John, but not to Jesus. So, so they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so they're given the Holy Spirit. So the point there is how trust in Jesus is essential to receive the Holy Spirit, that, that it's when you believe in Jesus that immediately you have the resources, the full resources of the Holy Spirit. And so this is consistent with our view uh, of God and the understanding of the Holy Spirit. He indwells a believer uh, at the moment we trust in Jesus, and, and that immediately happens. And so that's just some of the kind of maybe confusing stories and, and how the Spirit was delayed. We'll talk a little bit more about kind of our view of the Holy Spirit in response to the book of Acts. But there's a dramatic story also about uh, Ananias, and, and he's it says he's filled with Satan. And so what does that mean? That's in Acts 5. Again, that was a culmination in that tale of two temples section that was to speak of the role of the church in fulfilling the temple. And so in, in Acts 5, it talks about Ananias and his wife Sapphira. They sold a piece of property. And I should note, too, that that's right before, in a contrast, that uh, we see Joseph, who's called by the apostles uh, <clears throat> Barnabas, uh, that he sold a field and gave it to the the apostles as a gift, as a gift to God. So in contrast, Ananias kept some of what he had and was judged uh, by that. And so, you know, what does that mean uh, that, that, that the, the, what is it? Verses one to 11, <clears throat> that he was filled by Satan filled, it says in verse, here it is, that's what I was looking for. Verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So what is going on there? <clears throat> well, Peter indicates to the reader that Ananias was lying, and not just to him, but to God. And so since Satan is known as the father of lies, then his behavior was acting in alignment with Satan. Uh, does this mean that a Christian was possessed by Satan? Well, while Ananias was part of the church, we don't know if he was a true believer, uh, and that is not the point of the passage. In contrast to Barnabas, the just verses before, who gave freely to the church, Ananias only gave part and still wanted to be identified with the church. And so God judged him for lying, for being deceiving like Satan is. And this became an example for the church to remember that God takes sin and deceit seriously, that he sees the heart. Uh, he hates sin and is concerned for the purity of the church. And so just want to highlight those are kind of tricky passages. And uh, Drake, I know you had to step away there for a second, but uh, Eric, I didn't know if, if, if that was helpful. Uh, and Drake, I don't know how that was helpful for you, but I think those are some confusing stories. Um, I had two questions. Oh, I have one question. Um, why were they baptizing samaritans even though i weren't they didn't you say that they were enemies right so for the the jews the samaritans came out of the uh if you remember back in the old testament when the kingdom was split and it became uh judea and then israel and then when israel which are basically all the tribes except for um judah's tribe that when they were um, disciplined by God, that we know that because that's what the Bible said, uh, and they're disciplined for rejecting God, and so God's hoping that will help bring them back to Him. But in the in the discipline, the the kingdom of Assyria, they would um, try to repopulate by bringing other people groups into that area, so they basically became uh, not just jewish any longer and so they became samaritans and so the judean uh jewish uh members they looked down on samaritans because they weren't uh truly jewish they they married into other families that were non-jewish and so that carried over into uh what we're reading in the new testament that they looked down on them and so for jesus though uh, his love is for the whole world. And so his movement is going out into places that even the Jews, Jews would like to avoid and to bring the good news that they can be included 
that they are included, that they trust in Jesus to be part of this new family called the church. And so for a Jew, they would be really surprised, bud, that that these enemies were becoming part of God's people. For, for God and Jesus, like they died for the whole world, even those that reject him. Uh, and so that's that's really a testimony of the gospel. Okay. And then you were talking about how Ananias wasn't possessed by Satan. Could you tell me that one more time? It was kind of confusing when you... When you yeah, so there's this story, bud, that's in Acts 5. That was kind of the culmination of the tale of the two temples. So it's it's speaking to how the church, as as a fulfillment of the temple, was was loving people so well that they shared everything that they had in need. And oh, so yeah. they talked about how uh, in chapter four, as a culmination of this, that Joseph, who's called Barnabas, sold a field and brought the money and gave it to the church as a, as a way to show his love. And uh, and then in contrast, Ananias, he uh, sold a piece of property and he kept back some for himself, which in response, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So people wonder, like, does that mean that Satan can uh, indwell in the church? And the answer is no, that that we don't know that we know that Ananias was part of the church. We don't know if he's a believer. But more than that, uh, the the understanding is that when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, that that he is who controls us, that we allow him to control our life. We'll look at that in a second, looking at okay. some other Bible passages, but that Satan can't indwell where the Holy Spirit indwells. He can try to influence, he can try to lie and, and deceive us, but but he, he can't indwell a true believer. And so there's just some question, what does that mean? Well, it's really to, to say that the true point of that is how God takes deceit and sin seriously and that Ananias identified more with the father of lies with Satan and so uh we we need to give ourselves fully to God that's that's what we need to do um but but when you trust in Jesus you have the full resource resource of the Holy Spirit indwelled in you there's no space for Satan to indwell in you okay thank you Good questions, bud. These are this is where we're reading a story that's depicting a knowledge of God. And so we have to really understand what did it mean to them, but through a, a form of literature that's narrative. And so it makes it a little bit trickier because some of the old the New Testament letters, they're very direct speech that we're going to read. And so it's very uh it'll just say it like it is. Where in Acts, we're learning theology about God through stories of people's lives. And okay. so it, it makes it a little bit harder. And so people have a lot of questions about this. So thanks for yeah. asking those questions, but that's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Erica, I'll, I, I know Drake had a, a few questions. If you had any other ones, otherwise I wanted to, to look at some of the theology of the spirit, because that's such a big theme. But any other, other thoughts about this section, Acts 1 to 12? No, I'm uh, going to run uh, out of battery, so I'm going, okay. to I'm going to switch to from my iPad to laptop, okay? Okay, uh, no worries. Yeah. yeah. So, Drake, I think as, as we're reading through the book of Acts and we're learning about the start of the church and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then it's really important for us to, to kind of step back and to talk about, okay, what do I think about the Holy Spirit? What do I think about the church? So this week, because in these first verses or in these first chapters, it talks a lot about the Holy Spirit and it continues to do so. I wanted to focus our attention on a, on a theology of the Holy Spirit. Next time we're going to look at the, the church in more uh, detail. And so let's, um, Okay, so theological question. So today we're going to conclude with some conclusions about who God is. That's what theology means. And as I was just telling you, Drake, we're going to look specifically this week at a view of the Holy Spirit, because that's such a major theme in the book of Acts. And then next time we're going to look at 
our view of the church, because that's the second theme that's really significant to the book of Acts. And so what is the role of the Holy Spirit today? So the Holy Spirit is a significant theme in the New Testament that marks uh, a change from the old to the new era. And so as we're reading through the book of Acts, it creates questions knowing that this is a is a, a story of the church, then, then what of what we read in the book of Acts should we expect from the Holy Spirit today? And so what is the role of the Holy Spirit today? <clears throat> well, the Spirit's been very active in all of human history. You see the first mention of the Holy Spirit in the creation story hovering over the water. So the Holy Spirit isn't new. Uh, it's just that there's a turning point of the role and the and the function of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Before Acts 2, the Spirit's ministry was selective and temporary. We saw that as an example in Judges, that the Spirit would, would uh, be uh, temporarily indwelt in the people uh, that God was working through, but that was not for all people, okay? That was for individuals. Now, after the Spirit... Uh, came in Acts 2, it started a new ministry to indwell believers permanently. And so today, the role of the Holy Spirit is of convicting, of regenerating, of sealing, indwelling, baptizing, giving gifts, illuminating, and empowering. Let me just highlight those briefly. Convicting, that's what the Spirit does for those before they trust in Jesus. So the Spirit is out, persuading non-believers of, of their brokenness, that they have a need that's fulfilled in Jesus. You can see this in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. So the Spirit's out in the world, convicting the world of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So creating a need, helping them see the need for Jesus. That's the Spirit's job. Now, the moment you trust in Jesus... You're, you're regenerated, you're sealed, you're indwelt, and you're baptized, okay? So those are <clears throat> numbers two through five. The regeneration, this is that transformation, changing people, giving them new life, uh, that sin no long, longer controls those who trust in Jesus. It's still uh, influence, it's still a struggle, but it doesn't have authority. And you see that in, in Titus 3 five that that happens when we trust in Jesus the sealing is this kind of guarantee that we belong to God it's kind of like in in their culture a seal marked uh something that was was authoritative and it was binding and so here it's it's binding the spirit marks us we belong to God this gives us an assurance of our salvation that the spirit's in us you can Read about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. And then the other two, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he resides in us. He's teaching us. It's He's helping us live and become more like Jesus. You can read about that in John 14. And then the baptism, this is the spiritual identification in the church, in the body of Christ, that we're related to each other and our head. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. And I just want to mention on that, as we talk about the, the church, that that we are all members of the church, uh, capital C, the moment we trust in Jesus, that we're all brothers and sisters spiritually. And then as a practical application, we want to identify with a local church, being a member of, of a local church. But, but that's something that we're a member of spiritually the moment we trust in Jesus. Now, the last three, gifting, illumination, and empowering, those happen as we're we're living our, our Christian life. These are resources that that are available for us. Uh, gifting our supernatural abilities that build up the body. You can read about that more in 1 Corinthians 12. The, the illumination of the Spirit. This is where uh, the Spirit clarifies uh, things that are of God, that he's, he's bringing to mind the things of God. And you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 13. Then the last one we're going to look at a little bit more later is the empowering uh, role of the Spirit, where he's energizing us to live the Christian life. And so I just want to stop there.
and just check in with you guys. Any any questions about the role of the Holy Spirit today? Otherwise, we'll just keep working through this. Um, one of my questions was, what happens if you, because you said that you stay, the Holy Spirit stays in you forever. Yeah. What happens if you believe in God, then the Holy Spirit's in you permanently. But what happens if you stop believing in him? So we'll look at uh, an important verse in Ephesians that says a command be filled by the Spirit. That's that idea of empowering is, so the idea there, but is the, the Spirit, I believe, and I'm not God, so he'll know where where things will happen in terms of people's salvation. What I do know is that it, true believers, even if they fall away and they make mistakes and and uh, don't live out that reality, they don't have the experience of the resource of the Holy Spirit in their life because they're choosing not to uh, fulfill that command that we're going to look at in Ephesians 5. So okay. we have the, the Spirit marks us. You know, I've heard someone say that um, we don't need more of God. He's given all the resources to us. He needs more of us in a sense of, of submission. Like we need to give okay. ourselves to him. And that's a daily choice that we give. And it's so that we experience more of his reality in our day to day. And and so that's as we trust in him. But that doesn't mean that we have less of the spirit. It just means that we're experiating less because we don't trust. Okay. So and we'll look my at last... that more. But good question, bud. Okay. And then my last question was, um, how does the spirit persuade you to believe in God? Like, does he go into people like Christians and give them ideas to help persuade people? Or does he like persuade them? That's a good them? question because the convicting role that we talked about, that's in John 16, 8 through 11. It's speaking of him out with those that haven't yet trusted in Jesus that he's influencing. It's described as he's kind of like, if you think of the world like a courtroom, God's the judge. And the Holy Spirit's kind of like the lawyer and, oh, okay. and and we're on trial, you know, before we trust in him in the sense that that he's trying to persuade us uh, to to believe like a lawyer would in a courtroom. I don't know if that metaphor okay. translates well, but that's the idea is he's he's trying to to prompt people on a spiritual level. So kind of at a soul level that might be an idea. It might be um, uh, an intuition that he's speaking in, in kind of a soul level. And so that's where he's a Holy spirit. He's a, he's a spiritual reality that's not physical and is active. And so there's a sense where in that part of us that we uh, engage the spiritual reality and in our soul that um, that he's prompting us, he's influencing us, even those that don't trust in Jesus yet. Oh, okay. Okay. That was my last question. That yeah. Makes sense. So we'll keep walking through this. And Erica, if you have other questions or thoughts, just let me know. So <clears throat> as we continue this, now when we talk about the gifting of the Holy Spirit, so that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, there's some confusion about the miraculous gifts of the Spirit and specifically the gift of tongues. And so there's <clears throat> in the book of Corinthians talks about these kind of miraculous gifts that are given where there's healing and miracles and, and speaking in tongues. And so what is that about? And should all Christians speak in tongues? <clears throat> so one of the great changes that has taken place in the evangelical church community in recent years is the growth of the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. So some contend that a charismatic experience is essential to receiving the full richness of what God has to offer. Now, others on the other side see it as a perversion of the true gospel and a great threat to biblical Christianity. And then still others land in the middle. And uh, I just want to share my appreciation for Josiah Venture. They're a missionary organization that wants to work through the local church, and they've been trying to understand how do they work through the grow growing movement of the Pentecostal charismatic churches. And so, you know, how do we uh, be in that place where we're focusing on the essentials, not being divided by the non-essentials? And this is uh, not an essential doctrine, but it's an important one. 
And so those that are landing somewhere in the middle, you know, you're attracted maybe to the fervency of the worship uh, that so often characterizes the charismatic churches yet are concerned about the abuses that I've heard of that, uh, that are also seen in the movement. And so <clears throat> in terms of the sign gifts, uh, I believe the sign gifts, including tongues, but also healing, prophecy, and miracles had a special role in validating the presence and power of God during the initial expansion of the church. We looked at that in the book of Acts. And it it, it also provides some revelation and guidance until the ca canon was in place, until we had the scriptures. And I do not believe that the scripture teaches <clears throat> that the miraculous gifts have ceased at the end of this period that I think that the miraculous gifts are for today. Uh, but I, I also don't believe that they must be present in every church or in every period of history. Now, regarding whether Christians should speak in tongues, there's really two questions, two fundamental issues is how is this gifting based in the scriptures? Where do you see this in the scriptures? And then some might say, well, when I have a spiritual experience and I speak in tongues, speak in other languages that you might be able to not under, understand. It can feel like they are more spiritual than others that don't do that. And so I want to look at the point number two first, <clears throat> that regarding uh, just the maturity, you know, speaking in tongues is not an indication of someone being more spiritual. Uh, according to 1 Corinthians 12, God decides who receives it. And so it's not an indication of maturity, nor is someone being saved it's a gift. It's an act of grace. So every believer has a spiritual gift. Not everyone has the same gift. And it is for the common good. It's for the building up the, of the body as distributed by God. So that's the key. It is given by God. It's not something that's determined by us. It's a manifestation that's not related to our spiritual growth. So now as we think about point number one, so what, what's the scriptural support of speaking in tongues? So there's two ways to look at it. There's a, the story in Acts. So Acts 2, 10, and 19. And, and the speaking in tongues in these stories functions as a sign. It confirms the new function of the Holy Spirit that was new in this new era, Jesus coming and inaugurating the new era, the new covenant, that the Holy Spirit now indwells believers permanently. And, and so as it was indwelling non-Jews for a, a Jewish believer, that was new. And so as it was expanding to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, uh, the, the speaking in tongues functioned as, as, a, as a sign to demonstrate the reality of God's presence now in the Gentile believers. Now, that's in, in Acts. As we look at uh, the epistles, and specifically 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, that's looking at how the gospel reshapes our view of the weekly church gathering. And there's some there's some division in this church. And so it describes, you know, answering questions about what's the role of the miraculous gifts. Well, they were for the edification, the building up of the body, which in that section is to be interpreted in the assembly and the church gathered together, the believers gathered together. And so when God uh, does choose to bestow these gifts, they are to fit the biblical descriptions given for them, according to what's in the scriptures, as well as to be subject to all of the guidelines of the scriptures that govern their practice. And so just a few things, you know, what does it mean to speak in tongues? Well, the nature of the word means a human language. And so when we see that in Acts 2, and then also in 1 Corinthians 14, 10 to 11, and that's in relation to the Isaiah passage, but it's the nature of the word is a human language. It's a real language. It's just that people don't understand it. They need, it needs to be interpreted. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But it's important to understand it's, it's talking about a human language. Um, and so it's it's not an evidence of salvation. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 says that not everyone has the same gift. So you can't make it an evidence of something that not everyone can have. And so you cannot expect tongues to be given to all believers. It's not an evidence of their salvation. Uh, also, when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about how when the perfect comes that we won't need these miraculous gifts. And so in the context, the perfect is the return of Christ who is perfect. It's not referring to scripture. And so that's that's not a strong argument for uh, the gifts, the miraculous gifts to have ceased. And so the real question is, what are the expectations? So when we look at 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, we can see that it's a low priority. 
that there's a greater priority for the the orderliness of the worship gathering. So don't have it become so spontaneous that it, you lose a sense of what to expect and for people to come together. Uh, it also must be interpreted. Now, again, these are gifts that are given to speak for the edification of the church. And so it makes sense that there needs to be an interpretation because it's almost like a message that's given to the church. Uh, it's limited to a few times in the worship gathering and then it's done orderly. So uh, there needs to be a sense of, of structure to this. Now, there's some question about a prayer language as kind of relates. Uh, prayer language is not a gift. Uh, Paul may have had one. A friend of mine was talking with me about this. If you look at 1 Corinthians 14, 18, there's a description of Paul that can be interpreted as a prayer language. Uh, I've been encouraged because I haven't experienced this, that people uh, pray their, their prayer language quietly. Um, you could also look at, you know, in Romans 8, it talks about the groanings that the spirit's groaning. So there, there is some uh, indication that this is possible, although it's not an essential doctrine. So this shouldn't divide the church, but to give space to this, uh, my friend said, you know, it's something that, that she does quietly. Now, <clears throat> one question I've, I've received is, do we need an interpreter or no, if we need an interpreter for tongues, does this mean people should not speak out and pray in their heart language during the service, which we pray corporately at Anthem Church. And so how does this play into that? Well, if someone has a message, God is leading them to share, then naturally we would want it to be interpreted so that everyone understands it. Now, now it needs to be given under the authority of the leadership of the church. So our practice is to write a note and to give it to me, or you could text me. Uh, but it's, there's not an expectation that we need to rush into this. It's not something we need to be urgent towards. It's it's something to to compare it to the scriptures, to to pray together as a leadership, and uh, to make that decision together. Now, for those who are praying to God corporately in a sh in a shared language, we we primarily speak in English, but there are people that speak uh, together in small groups in their heart language or pray out to God in their heart language, because it's hard to sometimes communicate from uh, a second language. And so <clears throat> to, to remember what Paul's talking about here, he's talking about someone uh, having a word to edify the church. And so when we think about what prayer is, prayer is, is maybe as a secondary, it's an edification for the body. You know, that happens when you pray, but the purpose is to, to call out to God. And so it's not necessarily to edify the church the purpose is to to talk to god but as a corporate body and so i just share that because it's not necessarily to share a message with the church and so it's not exactly the same of what we're talking about here in terms of interpreting the mirac miraculous gifts of tongues and so while there's value in understanding what people are praying an interpreter isn't required for someone while they're praying but it's, it's a bit of a gray area. There's a spirit behind this that we'd like people to understand even while they're praying to understand what it is that they're saying. And, and so there needs to be some humility in this, some consideration for the people that are involved on a case by case basis. Uh, but if people cannot speak the language, then uh, God in his grace may impart the supernatural ability for people to hear God's word. Um, which is what I think is this whole section is getting at is the goal is for people to know God and so God might speak to them in this miraculous gift of tongues. And I also want to make the point that uh, there needs to be a lot of caution in this, that Satan wants to divide us. Uh, pride will use the miraculous gifts to, to really hurt people. And so we need to be surrendered. We need to be humble in this, that there's not a sense of I'm better than because I have this miraculous gifts. Um, you know, and I don't have personal experience as a pastor to incorporate the miraculous gifts. My uh, my background is more conservative. And so as I look at scripture, that it doesn't give grounds for these gifts to cease, that they are in, in the church age, then I want to, as a shepherd, to be discerning. And, and for the unity of the body, I want to create a space for uh, diverse forms of evangelical worship that are supported in scripture. And so I want to be inclusive to the degree that scripture is inclusive. And so that's where I think it's important for us to be talking through these things. Uh, the last two questions I want to highlight, and then we can talk more about, because it's related, 
is um, what is a baptism in the spirit? You'll see that in the scriptures that people are baptized in the spirit. When does it happen? Some people think that there's two spirit encounters. There's the first baptism, and the second baptism. So I want to talk about that just to kind of understand this. So the focus of this question is the role of regeneration. So when you think about those different roles of the spirit as, as when you trust in Jesus, you're, you're made new. And so the role of regeneration by the Holy Spirit at conversion is what we're talking about. And the baptism in the spirit is, is that new birth that we have in Christ at conversion. So the charismatic view believes in two baptism. It's largely based on the stories in Acts. And then again, when you look at Jesus, that he's conceived by the Holy Spirit, and then later the Spirit descended on him again at baptism. So it shows two. There you see the delay to the Holy Spirit that we talked about earlier. Now, the conservative view believes in one baptism based on the epistles that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, that every believer is uh, baptized in the Spirit, not based on their maturity. And, and it's a completed action. So when you look at the Greek, when it talks about being baptized, the word shows that it's completed action. It doesn't, it's not a continuous thing that's going to happen. It happened once. And so this means every believer has access to the full power of the Holy Spirit at conversion. They're not waiting for a second baptism. So that's a view that I, I support because of the direct statements by Paul describing the role of the Holy Spirit, which is more compelling to me because, uh, you know, in Acts and, and Luke, they're descriptive statements. And so the point of Acts is, is also to communicate how the message of the gospel is expanding through the power of the Holy Spirit from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. So the, the delayed giving of the Holy Spirit was to confirm the message of the gospel uh, that's that's um, forming new non-Jewish believers and that are that's a genuine experience of believers. And so that was a new function of the Spirit that we're seeing this new era that came at the arrival of uh, the Spirit at Pentecost with Jesus being the main character of the book of Acts. So it's it's his spirit that's indwelling the church. That happen, hasn't happened to that point. And, and so I think uh, I lean towards a conservative view. I think another way to look at it too is nowhere in the entire Bible are believers commanded to wait for a second filling of the Holy Spirit, which I know isn't maybe a, a strong argument, but it does give me pause that I think if it was something that important, there would be more said about it in, in direct statements in the epistles. And what we do have is it seems to indicate it's one uh, baptism. So the last question is, how is the baptism of the Spirit different from the filling of the Spirit? Because <clears throat> we saw that. And Drake, you had talked about this in terms of his people choose to trust in Jesus and they're sealed. And then maybe they drift away and uh stop growing, stop taking their, their faith seriously? How do you make sense of that? Well, I think Ephesians 5.18 uh, can give some explanation for us. Uh, in Ephesians 5.18, believers are commanded to be filled by the Spirit. So it's a command. It doesn't mean that the believer is without the full power of the Spirit. It's not be filled like an empty glass, that you don't have the Spirit, and now you need to be filled by the Spirit. <clears throat> it's not like that. The word a filled is a nautical term, much like what is described of the filling of wind into the sails of a ship. So the idea is just as a ship yields to the control of the wind, the believer must yield control of their will to the Holy Spirit. And so that's where we don't need more of God. We have all of what God has given us, full resource of the Holy Spirit. He needs more of us. And so we need to yield. We need to submit. And so the point is about submission to God through the Holy Spirit not access to God's power. We have full access to the, the uh, resource of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I know there's a lot, uh, and that covers a lot of what I know are issues that can often divide Christians, but I, I like to talk through it to have a conversation, but this can maybe be a first step in that conversation. But Drake and Erica, what are some thoughts and Maybe let's start with Erica first, Drake, uh, just uh, to be a gentleman here. If there's any questions or thoughts that you have, Erica. Uh, um, not, not really, but I think the, your explanation of uh, tongue 
and baptism. I think it makes sense. Um, I, I just feel that uh, um, even though we don't need to say tongue is necessary, particularly mm -hmm. in the corporate setting, um, but I think um, sometimes we seem also a little bit discouraged mm. yep. people from doing that, right? And yep. I, I personally find that uh, in the personal prayer is actually help me because sometimes we really run out of uh, <laughs> out yep. of uh, language to speak to God mm. and I feel that sometimes the, the teaching is too conservative that uh, um, and because I think if you read the Paul's um, the scripture Paul said that uh, I think he, he also say that he speak tongue right mm -hmm. but he yep. say that if you speak tongue in the corporate setting then if nobody translates, not helping. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I think that's, that's where I want to do. A, I, and I'm coming from more of the conservative background. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to inadvertently dismiss or discourage because the scriptures don't give me in my reading an indication that they've ceased. Although some might have that position. Uh, I, I I see it that they've continued. And, and even when we think about the Holy Spirit, I've always wanted to incorporate this verse that you reminded me of that is actually a verse that's uh, one that I read often that talks about the Holy Spirit groans with words uh, that we can't express. It's in Romans 8, verses 26. It says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep, deep for words. So I just think of that. A friend of mine that has a prayer language talks about the groaning that, like you were saying, like it just, you can't express it any other way. So I, I appreciate you sharing that, Erica. And if there's ways that, you know, I can do a better job of not discouraging because I just want to make sure that we're kind of in that balance of, of not being uh, spiritual, like some might say that like, things are abused. I think that's very extreme. But this other saying, I don't want to discourage too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, these are a lot of really significant topics to cover in a short period of yeah. time. <laughs> exactly. so that's where, like, if there's any questions or thoughts, like, I'd love to dialogue about them. And I think this is, you know, after me doing my best job at trying to highlight what are the the views and then you know where do i land you know these aren't essential doctrines i want to be united by the person and work of jesus and the scriptures they're authoritative and i'm not saying that my interpretation is authoritative i'm just saying the scriptures themselves are authoritative so we look to them together and i want to be like the bereans that that had discussion and had conversation together about them um, and then, of course, united by the uh, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's big part of, of you know, central part, not just a big part, a central part of what we're doing. Any other comments, Drake? Any other thoughts, bud? Um, uh, one comment would be, I thought it was interesting how they had special words for different types of baptisms that they had. So that's probably my only thought that I had. Everything else made sense. Yeah, that, that baptism Paul talks about, the spirit baptism is really to depict kind of the, the nature of the spirit that's, you know, indwelt us fully. Because baptiz baptism just means that you're submerged like in water. <clears throat> so we're just completely submerged in, in the spirit that he indwells in us. So uh, it's good stuff to be talking about. I appreciate that we're continuing to move through our, our story of the Bible reading plan. And I think, um, appreciate you guys being flexible at this different time as well. And so next time we're going to pick up at Acts 13 and we're going to look at Paul's missionary journeys. And we're going to look at how that frames the epistles, kind of the timing of his letters. We're going to look at the gospel conversations because the book of Acts is the only scripture that we have once the spirit indwells the church where we see Christians talking to non-Christians and there's, I think 13 or 16 gospel conversations 
that we're going to just highlight, but just to show how do we have a conversation with people outside the church as we're part of his mission. We'll look a little bit about the multi-ethnic uh, kind of uh, theme that's woven through there as well, uh, the multi-ethnic movement. And, and then the church is a big uh, theology that we'll talk about next time, because the two themes of Acts are the spirit and the church, that Jesus' story continues through his spirit and his church. And so today we talked more about his spirit next time we'll talk about his church. And so thank you so much for being a part of this. It's uh, it's a treat to, to learn with you. And thanks so much for all of your questions and comments. So are we going back to Saturday morning? I, I plan to do so. We had some scheduling conflict that we'll just, we'll have one, maybe two more on Sunday afternoon. But I'm excited to go back to Saturday because once we hit the epistles, what I want to look at is because we're going to hit, you know, Peter, his epistles, we'll look at Paul, some of his prison epistles, and then um, John. And I, I want to really kind of summarize uh, John's theology, Paul's unique theology, and Peter. So as we're reading their epistles, we kind of see kind of the big themes that they're talking about, because they have a different view on, on who Jesus is, a different perspective, I should say. Uh, same same conclusions, but just different angle. Okay. I just feel so, that maybe Saturday will have more attending. <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. I just, I wish I, I could. And I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do maybe even next time. But I appreciate your patience as we're just uh, scheduling challenges in the fall. But I, I know people are watching them because I've gotten some emails and comments uh, from people. So that's the beauty is we'll get this uploaded to YouTube so we can still reference it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Erica, for joining and Drake. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just a gift. Let me, let me close in prayer and then we'll uh, close out. Uh, God, I just thank you for just what you're teaching us as we look at the story of your church. It's such an important part of the biblical story and just understanding the role of the Holy Spirit and the role of, of your church that we are a part of. And so as we continue reading through Acts, uh, may you just challenge us, may you encourage us, and may you convict us so that we respond uh, in a way that you are leading us to live differently uh, according to your word. Thank you, God, so much for Erica and for Drake and for all of those that weren't able to join today. I just pray God a blessing on them as we continue reading through uh, your story in the Bible. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.